and I potentially have apologies from Kenneth, Kathy, and Robert Clark. Now I can't actually see everyone who's in this meeting, so Suzanne, you might need to keep me right. Just having a wee look just now with David to see attendees. <sighs> Right, David's in the meeting, which is good. I, I can see him now. <laughs> yeah, uh, can't see Robert in the meeting. Okay. Just, just to confirm that that's the apologies we have is Gordon Johnson, Kenneth Laurie, Kathy Kenn, and Robert Clark. I haven't received any further apologies, Jim. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. That is great. Okay. Um, before we start, there's a, a couple of things I want to do. So we've got a few sort of welcomes and a few sort of thank yous because we've got people who are leaving us or this will be their last meeting today. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Councillor Robert Bissett, um, who replaces Councillor Alison Black, becoming um, a voting member on the IGB. So welcome, Robert. I would also like to welcome Frank Donnelly, um, who is going to be a carer rep and he's here shadowing more than today. So I've also got um, a couple of, as I said, thank yous to um, some colleagues who um, will be leaving us today. So first of all, I want to thank Morvan Mack. So Morvan's been a board member since 2018 and has held the position of carer representative. And Mor Morvan has been really influential within the IJB and has really helped shape the direction of travel, especially in respect of mental health. Morvan, you are going to be a hard act to follow. And on behalf of us all, I would like to thank you for your outstanding contribution that you have made to the IGIB and for keeping this law all in order and, and holding them to account. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> We've also got, is Angela in the meeting today? She must be. So um, Angela Wallace, Professor Angela Wallace, um, who is currently the nurse director of NHS Force Valley and the longest serving member of the IGIB, is also leaving us. So Angela um, has worked in the NHS in a variety of posts in Glasgow, Fife and Forth Valley and has now chosen to return back um, to Glasgow where she started her career. Um, I hope you'll all agree with me when I say that, you know, I think that Angela's a very caring and compassionate person and it matters to her that we deliver the best possible care to our patients and service users. And I believe that this has come across um, in the support she's given to the Falkirk HSCP and the contribution she's made to the IGIB. Um, Angela, you will be missed and I wish you all the very best um, on behalf of the IGIB in your new role at NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. And this last one may come as a shock to you, but Gillian, our Chief Finance Officer, this is also Gillian's last meeting. Um, Gillian's been successful in being appointed to a promoted post within NHS Fourth Valley. So well done, Gillian. Gillian joined us in, in 2020 and I think quite simply has been fantastic. Gillian, um, for an accountant, has excellent communication skills and lots of lots of patience, I believe, for us non-finance people. And Gillian, I think what you've done is you've demystified budgets and financial planning and reporting and the board really have benefited tremendously from the approach that you have taken. So thank you so much for all of your hard work and all the very best in your new job. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So it's a bit of a sad day, really. <laughs> Anyhow, um, let's move on and can we have a look at the minute of the meeting um, of the 19th of November, please? OK, shall we just check for accuracy? Uh, so we've got page one. Page two. Which is actually, sorry, it's page, page two is really page five. So page five, page six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, are we happy to um, agree that that is an accurate minute of the last meeting? Thank you very much. That then takes us to item four, which is the action log. So there's a couple of things there. So the first item, um, I believe, um, will be included in Patricia's report. Um, the second item, which is to receive an update on Fourth Valley Wide Services, Patricia, is there something you want to say about that one? Uh, 
Um, there's an update on the Chief Officer's report. Oh, so there is. Sorry, I see that. Uh, three is the same. That's on the agenda, which is the readmission performance report. And four also is included in the Chief Officer report. Is that right? That's Perfect. Great. Great. Oh, three minutes ahead of time. Well done, me. OK, Patricia, I'm going to hand over to yourself now for item five, which is, which is the Chief Officer report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, members of the board, you'll see um, the regular Chief Officer report um, in front of you, and it um, provides an update on a, a number of work streams that are underway within the partnership and across Forth Valley. Um, in section one of the section four of the report outlines an update on um, COVID nineteen. It also um, reminds you of the delegated authority that we've had in place during the pandemic and recommending that that continues until the next meeting. Um, section four point five of the report summarises our activity in relation to the remobilisation plan. We continue to be under quite sustained pressure um, across the health and care system currently. Um, and you'll see within section four and section 4.7, the winter response, which outlines a whole range of our activity. Um, we've, we've seen, as outlined in section 4.11, an increase in the length of stay for unscheduled care at Fourth Valley <coughs> Oil. We've seen an increase in delays in discharge since Christmas. There's also a significant increase in community level demand for packages of care. And we're monitoring that situation quite closely. We have a number, several hundred people in our community waiting for packages of care, which is a significant risk and a significant demand. And we have a, a range of risk assessment and alternative provision in place. But nonetheless, that is an area of um, particular focus. Um, so section 4.12 gives you an update on care home assurance and members of the board are very familiar with um, those processes and that that continues. Um, we also outline some of the developments in relation to the treatment for high risk patients um, at 4.15 and in 4, 5. Point, section 5 and I draw your attention to 5.3 in relation to our response to the winter pressures, in particular the winter pressure collaboration, which includes um, Strathcarran Hospice, Compassionate Neighbours, RVS, Dial a Journey, Food Train, and a number of our existing partnerships. And that's to provide a range of supports to support people to transfer home and to support them in their initial days at home and link them in with provision of food um, and other supports around medications and other organisations. That has supported since it started in the middle of December, it's supported over 500 people and has made a significant additional support um, to, to support transfers home and, and discharges and indeed preventing some admissions. Section 5.6 outlines um, the developments in relation to mental health and wellbeing in primary care services. Members of the board will uh, appreciate that there has been um, a significant impact on mental health and wellbeing during the pandemic. So this is a, an important area of work and we'll keep you updated on that. Um, so in, we have been very focused on the pandemic, but the report, I hope, shows you a flavour of the range of work that has continued around the delivery of the strategic plan, but also key areas of work that have become even more important as a result of the pandemic. And that's in relation to our carers and our service users and the engagement of those carers and service users so that we can continue to develop and co-design and transform our services in line with their needs. So in section 5.19, there's an outline of the work we're planning in relation to improving that engagement and providing training during April and May to support that and to support a range of the transformation projects already underway or agreed by the IGB. In 5.21, um, there's details of the Health Inequalities and Wellbeing Fund, which we launched two weeks ago. 
and that's a range of funds to support organisations for up to £25,000 a year for two years to deliver particular programmes that address the, the local uh, needs in terms of health and wellbeing. In section six, there's a summary of the recent joint inspection of adult support and protection arrangements and um, highlighting the outcome of that. That provides a range of assurance statements in relation to um, the, assess, the assessment of um, the arrangements for adult support and protection in Falkirk. It's not like other inspections where you get a grading. Um, it produces, they produce um, assurance in relation to the arrangements. So you will see we have some areas of improvement, but um, they recognise some real strengths and robust arrangements that we have in place in Falkirk. So the, the improvement plan will um, come back to the IGB um, in due course, having been to the Adult Support Protection Committee and will come in through clinical care governance. Section seven um, outlines the progress around Falkirk Community Hospital um, master plan and details some of the um, governance arrangements. There's been a significant um, amount of work and I have to thank members of our strategic planning group and members of the board who have engaged consistently and really actively in the range of workshops that we've held to start to design and think about what could be on that site. Um, and I really commend their efforts. There's a number of our members have been at every single workshop and um, the feedback from other colleagues and other participants is about this, the value of, of their contributions. So you will see in 7.1 some of the um, discussions that I've had to date about the provision of services. It's at very early stages and we're hoping to have the initial agreement into Scottish Government in the summer, but we'll keep the, the, um, the board updated. It's a complex project in that the board has responsibility for the strategic planning for community health and care services, but it's um, the N NHS Forth Valley's land and capital asset and capital investment and we will look to resolve some issues around Forth Valley wide services on that site. So the governance is complex in that some things will need to be decided by the board, the IGB, the NHS board, Clax and Stirling IGB and also Falkirk Council in relation to the um, commitment of the 3.7 million for an intermediate care facility. So thank you for everyone's contributed today and we will continue to engage with you. Um, so there's an update as well on primary care premises investment programme, which we're running alongside Falkirk Community Hospital because potentially we could resolve some of the issues in relation to primary care provision on that site. And we've got a development session for the board in a couple of weeks to go into that in more detail. Section eight is about the home support and supported living framework and an update to that. And I'm, I'm sorry to report to members of the board that we've not been able to make the progress we had hoped um, with that contract. It's an important contract and particularly with the significant increase in demand that we're seeing from the community and from hospital discharges. We really need to work with our providers, our carers, our service users to co-design the future contract for the next three years, taking all of that into account. And we have not been able to do that just because of the pressures of work and other areas that we've had to prioritise. So we're proposing for the board's consideration that we extend the current contract from September to March 2023. <clears throat> the board had agreed in November that we would extend it from June to, to from April, sorry, to September, and we're seeking a further six months extension to enable us to do that work. The, the quality of the contract will be much greater if we are able to do that um, in depth consultation. So section nine of the report um, focuses on the National Care Service for Scotland and provides an update on the recent publication of the responses to the consultation we're currently waiting for the Scottish Government's response to that consultation and an outline of the, the plan for the next, um, next stage of the development of that. 
Um, the rest of the paper gives you updates on the integrated workforce plan and finance and, as usual, a list of recent consultations. So if I go back to the recommendations, the board's asked to continue to delegate authority to myself as chief officer to be reviewed at the next board meeting. You're asked to agree to extend the current home support and supported living contract for an additional six months to the end of March 2023. And finally, to delegate authority to take appropriate action following the exploration work on the potential to bring additional providers onto the current framework. Apologies, I didn't cover that. Because of the increase in demand, we would like to bring additional providers into the care at home contract without waiting for a further 12 months for um, the new contract to be in place. So apologies, I should have covered that. But I hope that um, gives you a good flavour of the report, which, as usual, has got a lot of information in it. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. And um, do we have any questions for Patricia? Fiona Colley. Yeah, a, a couple of comments. First of all, I'd like to echo the, the, the comments that you made at the beginning regarding Morvan, uh, Gillian and Angela. Um, all three of them will be greatly missed from this um, um, IJB and, and from the partnership. And uh, uh, thank you so much for everything you've done to certainly help me when I've been chair and also vice chair. It's been it's been fantastic and um, you'll be very much missed. Um, I, I wanted to just put on record around the, the Winter Pressures Collaborative. I thought that what an excellent piece of work that has been and um, a, I think a, a fantastic model going forward um, about how we can do things a, a little bit differently to to what what the standard discharge from hospital is and, and actually make a, a fundamental difference to people's lives. So I, I, I just wanted to put that on record um, and also um, to um, uh, give my support to the the uh, recommendation and delay in the, the um, framework uh, for the, the um, home support, um, because I, th I think um, we, we all understand the pressures right across the, 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 the system and that's you you know it's it, it it's not just people in the front line it's every level um every every part of the system is under pressure and i think to be able to um have the time to be able to do this in the way that that everybody wants to i think to give that 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 little bit of extra time i think is really important um, I have one question, and I'm not sure, Patricia. I'm not sure if the, the information is available on this yet, and 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 it's something that, um, I've actually I've had a, a couple of, of questions around through my um, um through my councillor work um, around the high risk COVID and antivirals, um, and I wondered if you knew, um, how um, how this might work in relation to future testing and. Um, the individual and people within their households to enable people to get access to those antivirals as quickly as possible. Uh, you, you might not have the answer and that's fine, you know, because I know that some of this stuff is called, still kind of not 100% clear, but I just wondered if you knew. Um, I, I don't know, but I don't know if Andrew is able to shed some light on that, Andrew. Can I just pa paraphrase your question, Fiona? So this is about the, the ultra high risk patients accessing the, the, the antivirals. So we do have a pathway in place. This was an ask um, just before Christmas that we really developed a brand new service, including <laughs> inpatient day case treatment and outpatient treatments as well. Um, this is for people who are, it's not quite the shielding group who we remember from before, but it is patients who are deemed to be uh, ultra high risk of serious complications should they contract COVID. So at this first sign of them being tested positive, they can access this pathway. So we have a, an access line set up through NHS4 Valley, which I think has been publicised. Maybe actually it just occurred to me, I'm not sure how widely that's been publicised, but it's certainly on our website and I think there was a press release around it. Um, what has happened though, so, so we've established routes in to get the, the IV treatment and the oral treatments. Um, which are shown to reduce uh, the, the impact of COVID and improve outcomes. 
the the difficulty has been over the last couple of weeks we have seen the demand hugely outstrip the capacity the initial planning information that we got from sg said that this is what we should expect and this is where service we needed to be built to deliver and, and we've vastly exceeded that because of the recent spike in activity so we are playing a little bit of a catch up just now at the very least people will get the oral treatments um, we've not been able to get absolutely everybody in for the IV treatments the way we would have wanted to, and there has been some staffing issues around that in the same way that staffing has affected the, the whole system. So we have established the pathways. They are they are, they are delivering what they needed to, to deliver um, from the initial ask, but we are having to, to look to try and expand that capacity. And the difficulty is that everybody's exceptionally busy and we don't have the skilled staff to deliver IV treatments the way that uh, that we would want. In terms of the community, I mean, it's always been envisaged that at the moment this is going through the hospital, going through the acute system, but it was really envisaged that uh, there would be the opportunity for those treatments to be carried out in the home setting. And that is still uh, the part of the proposal. The initial pathways had to be established through the acute, but hospital home services, which is a phrase that people will be familiar with, where um, there is a, a high level of supervision um, given uh, for people and with slightly more complex needs from hospital services in their own homes um, and the OPAT service, uh, which is the outpatient antibiotic therapy service, have always been um, uh, looking to see if they can then take on that the delivery of the, those part of the service in people's homes. We're not quite at that point yet. As I said, we've actually been a little bit overwhelmed uh, in the last couple of weeks with uh, the demand, but we're correcting that and, and we have a, there is a plan and a proposal um, for how that can reach out into the community. And if people are looking for a little bit more information, we have a couple of excellent clinical leads in that uh, area, and I'm sure they'd be happy to provide that offline or, or via email. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Fiona, are you happy with that response? Yeah, and I can follow up anything that I'm, I'm, I'm getting specifics about. Brilliant, OK. And um, Margot. Margot, I think your microphone's still off. Right, sorry about that. Uh, I think all my question may be answered when I attend the development session on the 28th, but it's the primary care investment. Obviously a victim of the media here, but last night it was reported that a number of GP practices in my own area, sort of Brays and Polmont, uh, are not taking on any new patients. And I wondered if there are plans afoot to do this, and if in some ways what's going on with the community hospital and the wellness hub, et cetera, if that will affect that situation. Patricia, oh, David, you're going to come in and, and respond to Margot. Yeah, if, I think David yeah. would respond, thanks. Yeah, if that's okay. Um, obviously, I work in the Bray's area, Margot. So, so you're right. The, the three practices at Meadowbank Health Centre are uh, are very full. They're bursting at the seams, and so we're not routinely accepting patients. However, anybody that's in the area who needs a GP will still be allocated to one of the three practices. So this is a this is something that practices do when they're really full, but, but patients in the area will still get access to GP services. They just have to be allocated to one of the practices. Um, we are they are building more houses and more population in our area, so we are desperately in need of more space at Meadowbank. And yes, the, the, the premises programme should deliver more space for the Meadowbank practices. So, um, and some of that will involve people working from hubs either in down in Grangemouth or up in Falkirk Community Hospital to deliver care for our patients in the Braes area. So, so yeah, I am really hopeful. There is obviously a time pressure because we're full now and we need changes as soon as possible, but I am hopeful that this premises programme will will deliver the, the space we need to increase our capacity in the Braes. Thank you. Thank you, David. And we've got one last question from Margot, I believe. I'm sorry, Marvin. Apologies. That's OK, no problem. Um, it's really a series of comments rather than a question. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention was the information that's here about the link workers. 
in the hospitals, which is really, really good to hear about. Um, I have been fortunate to be involved with um, the ongoing um, developments regarding the Falkirk Community Hospital Plan and also the Primary Care Improvement Plan. So I have been hearing through that from some of the link workers who are involved. And um, I'm very much assured that they, they're making a big impact there, both in terms of helping people being discharged from hospital and also once they get home again. It seems to be a wonderful service and uh, it's, it's really good to hear about that. Um, the other comments I wanted to make were um, in relation to the um, ongoing of the um, commissioning of um, organisations, uh, sorry, to, for the um, care at home. Um, I, I would agree that I, I think it's a good idea to delay it again. I would rather it was right than that we, we model through. I think that's the best idea, make sure that it's actually in place properly. And I think it will certainly help that you're going to add people to the list. Um, so those are my comments. Okay, thank you, Marvin. Anyone else? No. On that basis then, are we willing to agree a uh, recommendation 2.1? which is to continue to delegate authority to the chief officer to be reviewed in the ne at the next meeting. Yeah. 2.2, .2, which is um, agree to extend the current home support and supported living contract. And 2.3, delegate authority to the chief officer to take appropriate action following the exploration work on the potential to bring additional providers onto the current framework. Okay, this is difficult in teams, but I'm seeing no hands to suggest that they don't agree to any of those. So. We will just, uh, Patricia, say that uh, the board have agreed um, to, to all of your recommendations and we will move on. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item six. And it's the finance report and that will be uh, Gillian. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. The finance report provides a, an update on the financial position as at December <clears throat> and also includes commentary on the, the forecast outturn for the year. I would draw your attention to section three in the paper, which outlines the overall annual budget as reported at December, which stood at £254.1 million, which was comprised of £223.6 million in respect of integrated budget, with a further £38.5 million in respect of set-aside services. There's been a range of increases and budget adjustments applied to the budget since uh, that that was reported at the last meeting, and that's outlined in table one in the paper. In terms of year-to-date performance, Section 4, Table 2, outlines the position as at December. A combined overspend of 527,000 is reported. That's comprised of 623,000 in respect to large hospital services, 1.2 million in respect of primary care services, even in terms of social care, and that's all offset by a 1.3 million underspend in relation to community health care services. In Sections 4.3, to 4.6 of the paper outline a number of key performance issues that's been consistently reported to the board throughout the year. In terms of savings delivery, um, section 4.7 outlines the current position where just around £1.9 million worth of savings have been delivered as at December. It's estimated that around £2.2 million of the programme has been impacted by COVID and that will be offset by COVID funding as agreed through Scottish Government. Mm. In terms of COVID costs, section five in the paper outlines the current position during the year and the forecast for the total costs expected to be incurred in financial year 21-22 is £8.4 million. Pounds. Scottish Government advice was that any existing COVID reserves should be used to meet those costs in the first instance, so members will be aware that we have around a £6.4 million pounds COVID reserve that we would deploy in full to meet those costs. So that meant that we've been looking for another two million from the Scottish Government and we've been reporting that consistently throughout the year in the quarterly returns that we submit to Scottish Government. I've drawn your attention to Appendix 2 in the paper, which outlines the latest funding allocation that's been confirmed by Scottish Government, where Falkirk IGIB have been allocated £15.5 million pounds respect to COVID costs in 2021-22. That's obviously £13.5 million pounds more than we requested throughout the course of the year. And the Scottish Government have stipulated that where that funding is not used in year, it must be carried forward through an earmarked COVID reserve. 
The IGIB Chief Finance Officer Network have been very clear to Scottish Government that from a technical accounting perspective, that funding that will sit in IGIB reserves can only be in respect to delegated services. So again, whilst the funding is very welcome, it can really only be used and deployed for um, service areas within the IGIB's remit. As it stands at the moment, the Scottish Government have advised IGIBs not to plan on any COVID funding coming forward during 22-23. So obviously, if we are sitting with excess COVID reserves, we'd be expected to deploy those in 22-23 for any ongoing additional costs. And I estimate that the additional costs in terms of PPE, temporary staff and costs and infection prevention and control are in the region of £7.5 million. So that would be the first call on any excess COVID reserves. I do expect there to be a balance. Um, available of around £6 million. Pounds. That's what we're, we're working to at the moment. And there have been early discussions locally between chief officers and chief finance officers and our colleagues in, in Clax and Stirling around how that might be deployed. <clears throat> and it's proposed that that would be used to help whole systems recovery. And that would include set aside services, including unscheduled care. And we would look to, to bring a business case forward to outline how we would deploy the use of any excess COVID reserves. And I'd anticipate we'd be able to bring that to the, the next IGIB meeting. In terms of the forecast outturn, section six in the paper confirms based on the information at December, the trend suggested we were looking at a, a net overspend of 193,000 and the expectation was that that could be absorbed locally to deliver break even. <clears throat> um, obviously, since this paper has been produced, I've since received the, received the February information and we are absolutely on track to deliver a break even position in the current financial year. In terms of the recommendations of the report, then I'll take you back to section two. IGIB members are asked to note the year to date overspend that's been reported at December, to note that the forecast outturn remains at break even for the financial year, to prove the breakdown of the payments to Falkirk Council and NHS Fourth Valley, which are summarised in Appendix One, and also to approve the suggested approach to any excess COVID reserves, whereby we would use them to, to help reshape whole system services within the delegated responsibilities of the IGIB to support our post-COVID recovery. I'm happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you, Gillian. Do we have any questions? We've got Cecil Meekeljohn first. Good morning, everybody. Um, I suppose I'm going to be the one that's going to ask the awkward question, um, Gillian, so apologies in advance. But in Table 3, um, where we've got the, 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 um, the proposed savings, etc., there's a number of reds. Um, how confident are we that those reds will be able to be turned to, to greens um, during the year? Um, and also, while we have the, the, the COVID monies, does that um, allow any flexibility um, there to be able to reinvest in the services around transformation? Thank you. Yeah, in terms of where we're at in the current financial year, I don't see much prospect of some of those reds um, being uh, converted into greens, to be honest. Some of that is COVID related, some is not COVID related. So we would absolutely be applying, as I say, 2.2 million is the estimate of the, the impact of the COVID um, non-delivery, if you like, of savings. So that, that will be applied and it's already taken into the account. But certainly going forward in terms of what would be sitting in COVID reserves, absolutely, that's what we would be looking to take forward. And as I say, I think there will be around £6 million pounds of excess, if you like, COVID reserves that we can use to support transformation and recovery. Thank you, Gillian. Um, Morvan. Um, thank you. I wanted to ask questions regarding the, the home care services. Um, I know there's been a lot of pressure there, and I know there still is, um, and carers in particular have been feeling it throughout the pandemic and ongoing. Um, my main question is relating to any savings that may have been made there in relation to the fact that some services um, of necessity have not been available for carers to use, um, particularly in terms of daycare and also in terms of the packages. If there are any savings there that have been made, will that be ploughed back into the home care service in the coming year? We would certainly look at that. Absolutely. There have been some non-recurrent savings made, but they have been at the margins because we've been instructed to continue certainly to pay providers based on planned care levels to keep them sustainable. So the saving has been, as I say, at the margins. But certainly um, in terms of the previous year, we have uh, created a significant reserve, particularly around carers, because we knew that there was impact 
um, there for unpaid carers and volunteers. So we're actually the, the carer strategy group has started back up again this week, actually. So we're looking at how we could deploy that creatively and innovatively to help support um, our, our carers. Thank you, Julian. OK, thanks, Julian. Do we have any other questions or comments for Julian? No, I don't think so. OK, um, in terms of uh, Gillian's uh, recommendations, so the first two are just simply to note. So we need approval for 2.3, which is to approve the breakdown of payments to Falkirk Council and NHS Fourth Valley. Um, are we happy to approve that? Yeah. And uh, to approve the suggested approach to excess COVID reserves. Yeah. OK, Gillian, you have approval for um, your items. Um, Gillian, I believe you're next on the agenda, item seven, which is budget report for 2022-23. Thank you. Yep, so this provides an update to the business case that was previously prevented, uh, presented in November and it, it confirms the opening budget for financial year 22-23. Section three in the paper and table one outlines the, the outcome of negotiation with partners and the Scottish Government funding settlements. And you can see in the table there that the, the budget is estimated at just £225.9 uh, million for financial year 22-23. As I say, the opening budget reflects the Scottish Government conditions that's attached to the funding uplifts through NHS and the pass-through funding from a Falkirk Council as well. I would point out that that budget includes £2.4 million worth of non-recurring funding. Around just over half a million of that relates to funding that was provided by Scottish Government in relation to interim care placements. But there's a further £1.8 million that was provided by Falkirk Council in recognition of the ongoing pressures it's faced by health and social care in terms of their ability to deliver savings at this time, given the ongoing impact of the, the pandemic and the Council have advised that they'll revisit provision of that funding uh, next financial year. All of the financial plan and assumptions have been updated to reflect the latest position in terms of pay awards, national insurance contribution increases um, and other inflationary pressures. As a result, a total funding gap of £5.2 million is now estimated for financial year 22-23. That is an improvement compared to the £6 million gap that was reflected in the original business case back in November, and that's largely due to that provision of non recurring funding from Falkirk Council. So table two, which is in section three of the report, just outlines the estimated funding uplift and how that compares to the inflationary pressures that we're expecting to see. And you can see how that gap is comprised of £5.2 million. In terms of efficiency savings then, obviously in order to close that budget gap, we require efficiency savings equivalent to around 2% of the IGIB budget. And similar to previous years, we have a non-recurrent invest to save reserve that will be available to our locality teams and our partners to help support delivery of some of the savings and also to pump prime some of the innovation ideas that they might have. As it stands at the moment, we have um, efficiency savings proposals which total the 5.2 million and that's outlined in table four, which I hope you're able to read because it is a pretty um, big table um, with the writings relatively small, so hopefully um, you've been able to go through that. There were previously a number of income generation proposals that were included, if you remember, going back to the business case in November. Through discussion with Falkirk Council, these um, weren't supported, and that was really in line with the direction of travel under the Feely Report and creation of National Care Service, where obviously Scottish Government is intending to abolish fees for non-residential services, so it felt that wasn't really supportive of the general direction of travel. I would ask you to um, you know, pay close attention to the, the savings that are highlighted in red, so just under 48% of savings are classed as high risk at this stage in terms of deliverability. And that's largely due to the ongoing impact of COVID because we need to be able to release our staff to undertake some of the reviews to actually implement and drive forward the work. In terms of COVID itself, we discussed under the previous agenda item the, the, the costs and the expectations of Scottish Government in terms of how any reserves would be deployed. As it stands at the moment, I'm estimating those additional costs in terms of PPE, provider sustainability support, infection prevention and control, and temporary staffing costs to be in the region of £7.5 million. Pounds. So in terms of conclusions, based on the current financial plan and assumptions, an overall funding shortfall of £5.2 million is forecast. That has been addressed through 
identification of efficiency savings of corresponding amount. However, it is recognised that a significant proportion of those are currently delivered uh, as high risk. So in terms of the recommendations, I'll take you back to section two in the paper. Members are asked to approve the opening budget for 22-23, to note the budget gap of 5.2 million in the associated financial risk, and to approve the efficiency savings proposals to enable that balanced budget to be set for 22-23. And I'm happy to take any questions at this stage. Thank you, Gillian. Do we have any questions for Gillian? We have no questions. Okay. Um, so there's one item there that we need to note. Um, let's just, uh, for the purposes of the recording, um, are you all happy to approve in 2.1, which is the Sorry, opening? Um, Michelle, oh. I think Frank Donnelly had his hand up there. Oh, apologies, Frank. Um, I didn't see you. Um, would you like, on you go. Uh, there's a question on the finance. Uh, uh, are the costs spiralling? Out of control, everything going up, medication and everything like, like that. Is I don't see any on the paperwork to take that in because the other cost is spiraling. It's not just the pay for the staff and everything else. And you're talking about savings, yet we don't know what the cost is actually going to be because the fuel prices and everything, which will come into the budget. Is not a is this being taken aboard? Yeah, it has, Frank. So you're absolutely right. This is obviously prepared at a point in time, and it reflects the assumptions um, that we, that we know about at, at the current date. So within Table Two, there has been some provision for some of those um, increases. So whilst pay is a big um, percentage of that. There's also inflationary uplifts in respect to primary care prescribing. So we've estimated costs will go up by 1.7 million in terms of the prices of some of those drugs. We've also included general price inflation. Normally, Frank, that would run about two to two and a half percent. But I've increased that to three and a half because we are starting to see these utility increases, fuel price increases. We'll all be familiar with that. And we're also hearing from some of our um, external commission service providers that there's issues around business insurance as well. So there is an element of that built in, but it's absolutely at a point in time. And we'll keep the position very closely monitored during the course of the year to see if that changes. Thank you, Gillian. And apologies, Frank, I was just a bit too quick off the mark there. Um, anyone else? No? OK. So in terms of uh, Gillian's recommendations, um, are we um, happy to approve um, item 2.1, which is the opening budget for 2022-23? And lastly, are we um, happy to approve the efficiency savings plan to allow us to have a balanced budget to be set for 2022-23? Yes. Okay, Gillian, and um, both of your, um, you've got both of your approvals there. Okay, that then takes us on to item number eight, um, which is the HSCP communications update, and I believe Paul's going to be presenting this this morning. Yes. Hello, folks. Hi. Um, I think I have met many of you before or certainly ended up in your inboxes, but if not, um, I am Paul Sergeant. I am the communications officer for the partnership um, and I am presenting today a new uh, communications update and um, format um, ongoing monitoring report that will be presented at future boards. Um, so this one is a bit of a, a bumper pack. So it is the six month reporting period from um, July to December. Um, and it's a bit of a sort of test example to see um, what formatting and report, what monitoring format um, I can be providing to the board. Um, so it is intended to monitor um, the communications up um, communication activity that we've been doing over the past um, six months, and also the implementation of the communication strategy that was agreed um, by board last June. Um, so the body of the report um, covers our media activity. So just a, a brief highlight of um, 39 media mentions, so pieces of coverage, um, which covers local media, so Fogel Kerald and um, Lithgow Gazette, but also how we um, spread out wider to the BBC and um, specialist publications involving um, health and care in Scotland and things like that. 
and um, also covers our social media. So last year we set up some new social media channels and that is used to drive um, visits to our website, but also understanding of and um, general public understanding of the work that the partnership is doing. Um, and it also covers the work we've been doing to update uh, content on the website um, and drive con um, visits to there as well. So the, it, as I mentioned, there is quite a lot in the report and um, I think that reflects my very lucky position that um, communications officer spreads across lots of different teams and I get to speak to lots of different people and interact with different projects. And um, so there's a lot in there, but I'll pick out a few highlights of what's in the report. So if we go back way back to um, last July um, when we ran a um, pilot project with the Living Well Falkirk team um, piloting a new online advice hub using near me um, video calls. Um, it's just a little package there of the communications we did on, on that and the stakeholder work. So we pulled together a social media toolkit and that was shared with our partners that were involved. Um, but also we achieved um, media coverage in local press, so Bob Carroll and things like that. Um, I also would highlight the work we've been doing with the IELTS support and protection team. So I sit on the communication subgroup um, committee with them. Um, so for example, last August, we, um, the adult support committee, um, secured 500 dementia DVDs. So um, they were able to distribute them to all um, care homes in the local area and make them available at the local library. And um, so we were able to push that out through local media and our social media channels as well. Uh, and of course, we participated in lots of national campaigns um, and communication around that. And um, so for like when there's um, consultations that we would want people to be taking part in, whether it's the, the board itself responding or whether it's just encouraging people in Falkirk to respond to national consultations. So there was a bit of um, media and social media activity around the National Care Service, encouraging people to present their views. Um, but also things like when you've got national awareness days, so participating in power of attorney day um, and various other awareness days that are um, either promoted by individual organisations or in the case of power of attorney day that is led by Health and Social Care Scotland and promoted by all 31 um, partnerships. So that just details our activity there. Um, but also uh, at the end of the year, we um, promote help promote the annual performance report and again, there is a lot in there. So um, to help promote that internally, there was a bit of internal communications, so um, internal briefings and breaking it down into to sound bites and, and, and smaller messages. Um, and that went well, and we were able to push that through so um, media, local media as well. So that got hit coverage in the public Herald. But we continue to use um, the annual performance report to communicate our activity and we've been able to pull out the case studies and reuse them as blogs and use that as um, content on the website and encourage uh, to keep sharing the, the good practice that we've been doing. And of course, um, sharing funding opportunities is also a, a, a big piece of communication that we've been doing a lot. And um, so the Community Choices programme with Falkirk Council has presented lots of opportunities. It's gone through the different stages of um, encouraging people to apply and uh, encouraging people to vote because there was, of course, a uh, public participation budgetary um, element of that. Um, and also another piece, big piece of work was the best value um, report. So again, quite a wide ranging report that affected all of council. So we did a, an internal um, briefing on that one um, to show how that affected the IGB and how that um, represented the, the, the partnership. Um, and then if we move on from, from media coverage to the, the website, so we have been doing a bit of work and there's a lot of work still to be to be done to the website, um, but since July to December, um, there's just been some content refreshed, so making it more accessible, making things more joined up. So I think there was a lot of either duplication or things that were separated throughout the website. So that those have been condensed. So you'll see that in the, the main report, it details how we've um, simplified the information that's on the committee pages and um, information that's on the performance monitoring pages and the publications pages. So those have all been um, condensed and reformatted just to make it simpler for people finding information. And in terms of our internal communications, um, last July we launched a new monthly newsletter, Partnership Post, 
um, which really is used as a, as a summary and um, that we can share every month of what we've been doing to um, colleagues across health and social care in, in, in Falkirk. And that goes out to all um, Falkirk Council employees that are in, in social work and adult services, um, but also those that have signed up through NHS and also um, our commission providers to receive that as well. Um, and then lastly, on internal, we've also got examples of how um, media, new media and parliamentary monitoring updates get circulated to the IGB and senior leadership team. So really been useful um, as coronavirus has, has um, developed and um, changed. Um, so as the First Minister makes announcements, we're able to circulate that internally just so that everyone's aware of the latest development. Um, and then lastly, in the main body of the report, it notes um, upcoming activity. So you'll see that in the um, June um, update of this communications update. And um, so that would include things like how we've been progressing the Falkirk Community, Falkirk Community Hospital um, master plan project, and how we've been communicating that to stakeholders, and um, how we've been participating in awareness days, and um, things like um, larger projects with the in, discharge process and um, how we've improved that. There's a bit of work going on there about um, branding and bringing those um, work streams together. Um, so if I go back to the uh, recommendations of the report, so it's um, consider and comment on the content of the communications update. So um, whether this uh, format works as, a, as an ongoing um, update for communications activity, whether it includes all the different metrics that you want to be, to be monitoring, and approve the example report as the basis for um, future quarterly comms updates to all meetings. So um, that's June 1 would be January to March, September, April to June, and November, July to September. Um, so at this point, I would ask for any questions. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, do we have any questions for Paul or any comments? We have Fiona first. Uh, probably a, a, a general um, quick comment about the, uh, your um, report is really great, and you know it's been brilliant to see the growth in the the the, the health and social care partnership branded communications, and you know we can see more information going out not just on those digital routes, but on the the in, in the newspaper um, as well. So so getting that information out. Um, so I, I I just wanted to say that in general I I I spend some people might say too much time but some time on <laughs> social media so you know I I do regularly see what the information is coming through and 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 I think these developments are 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 really fantastic and I think that point about increasing the the reach into the website the reach into um, the the Living Well in Falkirk, the um, the online um, advice hub, the, the Near Me advice hub, you know, all of these things, these activities given multiple opportunities, I think, for, for people to find out about the work, to access support and to access information. So I think it's just a, a, a general well done and it's, it's great to see. Thanks, Fiona. And well done, Paul. We've also got Margo, I think, who wants to come in. Uh, right, really just to uh, commend the service. Um, every day is a school day for me. <laughs> and I think as far as patients and service user rep, I, I think it's important for them to have sources of information because knowledge is power. And I think it's, it's also important that my role is mainly to signpost people towards this information. Uh, obviously, use of the social media, I know that you'll have looked into this well, but there's always sort of slight issues of confidentiality, etc., and how far information is shared and the responsibilities of people using Facebook and Twitter as this method of, of, of uh, communicating. I think it's a tremendous service. I'm always glad to see your name pop up on the uh, the email when you're giving us information. But it was just that very minor point about issues using social media and, and what your sort of views are and your precautions that you take. 
Yes, definitely. And that, and that was definitely echoed last year when we set up the, the social media um, channel. So um, alongside that, we reviewed the media protocol of how we sign off content and how we sign off sort of responses to content, if there were ever to be concerns of that nature. Um, but we also established a set of social media guidelines. So that set out um, how we would, um, I want to monitor or, um, what's the word? How we would uh, manage the content that's on there. So if someone were to comment back or to provide negative feedback, there are certain um, sort of guidelines about how we would uh, editor editorialize that. And so, there's sets of guidelines and standards of the communication that we'd expect from social media. And so if you're talking about um, confidentiality or things like that, we have a um, process of when we would remove content or ask people to remove it. And um, so th certainly that has been um, taken into account. OK, thank, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Do we have any other questions for Paul? No, I don't think so. So if we just then go back to Paul's recommendations. So he's looking for us to approve um, 2.2, which is uh, to prove this as the example report, report sorry, um, as the basis for future quarterly communication. Are we happy to do that and approve that? Fantastic. Well done, Paul. Um, we have approved um, your, your current template. So thank you very much. That then takes us on to item nine, which is the performance monitoring report. And we've got Callum who's going to present that to us today, I believe. Thank you, Chair, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, the performance monitoring report presents the board with a summary of performance um, up to December 21 um, and provides a year on year comparison with um, an indication on direction of travel. There is a focus on exception reporting where the position is either deteriorating or um, is, a, is a challenge. Um, and I'm now just going to take you through some of the, the key areas highlighted in section one of the main report. The report highlights that there are continued pressures um, around ED for our compliance um, and also around delayed discharges. Um, and, and sections 3.1 and 3.3 of the report provide further detail on some of the, the ongoing actions to support these areas. There were 48% more adult protection referrals in the first three quarters of 21-22 compared to the same previous um, same period last year. Um, and, and just to note that the Adult Protection Committee continues to oversee uh, activity in this area. The report highlights the number of complaints received across both health um, and social work, um, as well as the percentage of complaints responded to within timescales, and also some of the main themes um, of the complaints received. For social work adult services, 76% of complaints in the first um, three quarters of 21-22 were responded to within timescales, and for NHS services, 75% um, were responded to uh, within timescales. For social work adult services, the overall sickness absence figure um, for the first three quarters of 21-22 was 12.1%, 12 12 um, and that's an increase from 9.5% in that same period last year. For NHS side, the, the overall December 21 sickness absence position was 6.8%, and that's a, a slight increase um, from 6.2% in December 20. The report details the latest position on waiting times for psychological therapies um, and in <laughs> December 21, just under 68% of, of patients started treatment within 18 weeks of referral. And this is an improvement from the previous month and also better than the performance um, in December 2020, which was 57.4%. Uh, and uh, it is also above the trajectory that was set by the remobilisation plan. Um, of 60% um, by December 21. The report also outlines the number of overdue occupational therapy pending assessments, um, and that increased from 280 at the end of September to 290 at the end of um, December. The exception report in uh, section 3.9 provides some further background to this area as well as some details 
um, on the, the review of OTE service provision um, across the, the partnership. Um, thank you for listening and, and happy to take any questions about any of the performance. Thank you very much, Callum. Do we have questions or comments for Callum? No. OK, I'm just going to give it another wee second. OK, uh, on the basis of the fact I do not believe we have any questions um, in terms of the recommendations, are we happy to um, note the content of the report and that appropriate management actions continue to be taken to address issues identified? Yes. OK, Callum, you've got off lightly there. Well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. OK, that then takes us to item 10, which is hospital readmission for Falkirk residents within 28 days of discharge. And I believe, Andrew Murray, you will present this today. Uh, yes, yes, I will, Michelle. I'm sure people are saving up the questions for this paper. Um, I'm sure they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, much anticipated. I think the, the request for some more information came uh, probably on the back of previous performance reports when people have been scrutinising it and you saw the indicators in there around readmission rates. So readmission re rates are a, a metric that can be generated fairly straightforwardly from background information and um, I'll take you to the paper in a second, but um, the, it's, it is a, it's a calculation, it's a statistical tool that's used to try and flag up where there may be areas of concern. So I'm going to walk people through the paper. I don't know if we like to screen share or not. I'm not going to screen share. Nobody else has done it up to this point, but I, it means I'm going to look slightly at as I look at the paper as I'm going through, and I won't be able to see anyone trying to attract my attention. So um, if you can bear that in mind, I don't have two screens here at the moment. So please interject, Michelle, if I'm missing, if I'm missing um, important non-verbal <laughs> information. Um, so uh, agenda item 10, hospital readmissions. So, it, this is a relatively technical area, so I'm going to take just a little bit of time, certainly talk through the executive summary and um, the recommendations, and then um, pick out some points for the from the paper just to, to highlight um, what we think or what I think um, it means when we, we see these statistics. So uh, the executive summary, and I know you'll have a chance to read it, and it's not the done thing necessarily to go through the whole paper, but but I, as I said, I think it's quite technical, and it's just to kind of remind people of of why I'm here um, with this paper. So um, under section one one, so so Public Health Scotland collect this data. Um, as I said, it's relatively straightforward to generate information from returns, which come from the health board all the time and then those are disseminated and some of those sit within very much the integration agenda and the partnership um, and those are, are brought to the to the partnership as uh, what's known as a core suite of integration indicators and under data indicator 14 there is a rate of readmissions uh, for Fokker residents um, in comparison to, to other health and social care um, partnerships and the, the Scotland position um, there are various criteria in the background to try and allow that to be a benchmarkable, if that's a word, um, statistic. Um, but as, as we mentioned in that first paragraph, differences in the system processes do not always facilitate like for like comparison. And in 1.2, um, the national figures though do show, and it's, so it's a very absolutely a, a valid question and the data has, has identified that. Um, why do Falkirk residents have uh, a hospital stay or who've had a hospital stay in any hospital across Scotland have a readmission rate of 163 out of 1,000, which is the highest rate in Scotland and above the national position of 120 or 12% per 1,000 discharges. So people who have been in a, a hospital and who uh, are then discharged, so whatever the cause of that admission, so it's important to, to highlight and I think it's in the text there somewhere, no matter what the cause of the admission, so it could be for an elective procedure, it could be for an emergency procedure or, or an emergency stay, um, and it might not necessarily be that the subsequent admission within 28 days is actually related to that initial um, episode of care, but within the definitions that counts as a readmission. And we've got a chart that we reference in 1.2, slightly further down chart one, which I will spend a moment or two on just to, to show you the step change, which uh, we um, which has been noticed and we've noticed as well in, in the data in terms of readmission rates. Um, that corresponds to 
again, I'm still an executive summary, how patients were coded um, in assessment areas um, with the introduction of a new patient management system. And those areas uh, have a, a return rate of about 5% returning to, to those areas. So the people have been assessed. These are assessment areas. They're not necessarily, uh, you don't necessarily go on to have an inpatient stay, but you may spend a period of time and you're put in to a space in the assessment area on the patient management system. Um, and I'll explain a wee bit more about why that has created some difficulties for us in the next paragraph. In fact, I'll just do it just now. So what we're talking about here is people who then have to, they've been assessed, they don't need admitted, but they've been in a space in an assessment area. Um, and that is designated as a ward attender on the system. Ward attenders should be recorded um, under outpatients. So it's a very specific type of outpatients, though, um, and it doesn't capture the, the correct uh, intervention, I think, that the person has had. So what we know is that when we've looked at this previously, a significant proportion of those people have come. They've, they've gone home within a few hours or uh, sometimes um, after a brief overnight assessment stay, um, but they're not inpatients and they are, uh, but they have been recorded essentially erroneously as, as inpatients. Um, and that is what we believe is going on with data. I'll say a wee bit more about that as we go through the paper, but it's, it's, there is a definite element of um, data quality and uh, a new system coming in, which has changed definitions that uh, we believe is, is what has driven that step change. So I'll move down the paper off the executive um, summary because I am asking, um, obviously, to, to please note the report. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the Information Quality and eHealth Learning Group, which looks at data quality and is very cited on this and how we work through this and eliminate uh, the phrase there is database variation so that we can see what the true clinical issue is. And I'll talk a wee bit about other ways that we can reassure ourselves about some of the quality of clinical care, because that's a fundamental question here, isn't it? That uh, if people are being readmitted, what is that? Is that telling us anything about the quality of clinical care? And this paper says that uh, we don't believe that that to be the case, um, but but it's the correct challenge, obviously, when you see the data. And 2.3 says that um, because there is ongoing work to address this uh, this data um, it's more than an anomaly, but certainly a recording issue that we would want to come back and make the offer to come back in six months and update on the progress to be able to do that. OK, I'll move down the paper now and I'll, I'll speed up. Don't worry. Um, so we've got I want you to, to really have a look at chart one. I think that uh, a picture speaks a thousand words and, and that certainly tells a story. So we introduced an um, uh, application a patient management system known as TRAC, TRAC Care, and that was in about 2018-19. And what you can see is that yes, previously, and I, we've done work before looking at that slight that slight difference between the, the national figure and, and uh, Falkirk, and it's replicated in Sterling Clax as well, um, figures, it's so that we could better understand it. Um, but you see the step change that I referred to. And the only thing that changed in our system at that point was a new patient management system. And as part of that implementation, these assessment areas pose the dilemma because in terms of recording, the, those patients should not be recorded as inpatients. And that is difficult to, uh, to get complete compliance with. And there are other reasons um, that that, is, that proves difficult to do. But what that means is people who have been through an assessment process and are asked to come back the next day, as is the case in many of these clinical pathways, that, or a couple of days later or three days later, uh, those patients are recorded as readmissions. And that's obviously erroneous. So that is what we believe happened. Um, sorry, I'm pointing to my screen there, expecting <laughs> you to be able to see it, in approximately 2018 19. And uh, I, I chaired the implementation group there, so I remember well the, the track here implementation. Um, but because we have seen that that gap uh, uh, to the extent that it is, that we obviously have had that fed back to us as well um, through um, Public Health Scotland, and uh, you know we, this is where the data quality group was set up to try and uh, eradicate that gap uh, due to data variation. Section four talks a little bit about the criteria for national reporting, and um, but that applies to everybody. So what is different about our system that has produced the, that data? 
is a key question. So that section is just really explaining the criteria. And when you look in, in section five, though, you see a bit more evidence of um, what I've been referring to in table one, which shows that um, 1819, when track care was coming in, was being implemented, and but prior to its full commissioning, um, and we've broken this down to Falkirk residents, obviously, the impact of the change of recording from outpatient to inpatient to clinical assessment unit. So these are patients recorded as inpatient in the clinical assessment unit in 2018. And then the second line there with data shows what happens after the migration to track gear. So you can see that, yes, we were aware that we, you know, and the activity numbers are significant there. Um, so there was, was small numbers being recorded as um, as inpatients instead of outpatients. And you see the difference with the percentage variation there. In a lot of cases, you know, we're, we're, we're well over double the number of um, patients being recorded now as inpatients. And when those people who are, obviously the patients themselves don't know any different, they're on a pathway, they're told to come back a few days later, that picks up statistically as a readmission. So uh, the rest of section five just uh, explains it a little bit more detail about that. At section six um, is an important area just to have a look at. So just prior to, to me, joining NHS 4 Valley, there was some work done to say that these definitions don't really tell us that key question. Or they don't answer the key question about what is the quality of clinical care, which is if someone has had contact or been through an inpatient stay with us, um, are they more likely to be readmitted? And is that a sign of uh, concern around quality of clinical care? So there was work done to apply some local criteria which really define that question uh, or the answer to that question a lot more clearly. Now this is not used by the health board so we're not able to benchmark but it's just it just shows you that if you apply the criterion 6-2 which is a, these are Falkirk residents they have attended uh, NHS 4 Valley and um, they've had an admission they've they're noted to be um, under a specialty at discharge and then they have to have an emergency readmission to that specialty of discharge, i.e. that is a continuation of that episode of care. Um, and you exclude the, the assessment unit activity um, because the assessment unit, as I said, is a very specific area. Um, you see what that actually does to the readmission rate. It takes it down to, to a, a very low rate, well below the rest of, of Scotland. We, don't, we can't benchmark that, but in terms of trying to sift out the, the answer to the question, you see that we're down to... Uh, a 7% um, readmission rate from a specialty and that is um, that that is uh, understood because of the clinical complexity in the course in course of various conditions you know that that is a not an unreasonable figure on uh, looking at the evidence base so that was work that was done to try and understand a bit better and if we continue to apply those criteria in the background you'll see that it's been fairly static um, in terms of those numbers and well below that that uh, Scottish benchmark, which is, as I said, it's, it's confounded by other variables that are in there. So I'll also just emphasise something in the summary, um, but what, what I believe um, produces the data is that we, we implemented it absolutely in good faith and we didn't do anything wrong with the implementation, but the assessment areas always present difficulties because the accuracy of recording there, it has to be very bespoke and the track year system does not allow for a ward attender um, a category. It's a binary inpatient or outpatient. And although the teams in those areas and the administrators who are, are recording those um, know the importance of it and, and know the importance of, of it recorded as outpatients. As you can see, the numbers erroneously recorded as inpatients were significant there. And we believe that that is what is driving um, the data that we are seeing. There is, um, so that that covers uh, 7.1 and 7.2. Um, under 7.4, I want to just make the point that when I look at data that tells me about the quality of care that the NHS is delivering in Fourth Valley, um, there are other data items which I think are, are much more indicative, uh, much more robust. And in 7.4, I mentioned the hospital standardised mortality ratio. So what 
that is um, obviously the word mortality is in there. So this is about people who die after being after having an episode of care in, in a, an acute hospital within 28 days. Oh, sorry, 30 days. So slightly longer um, timeline. So that is used as really the main that it's a, it's a very um, as I said, robust figure. It's, it has been thoroughly benchmarked with a huge amount of work over the last 10, 15 years to refine its accuracy. And that is a, obviously a very definite indicator of the quality of care overall. So if more people were dying um, in the Fourth Valley as a result uh, than expected, there's, there's an algorithm in the background that tells you what the expectation is. If more people were dying than expected, um, we would see it reflected in these figures and we would see it reflected in other figures uh, that, that we look at uh, across quality of care. And in actual fact, the most recent release shows that we are, if not the best, we're, we're equal best in Scotland. So fewer people, fewer people die than expected um, who have come through the acute hospital. Um, and it might feel like quite a, a blunt way of, of measuring things, but, it, but for me, because I, I'm aware of the the robustness of that um, particular metric um, is something that we should pay, I, I would suggest, a lot more attention to rather than necessarily the readmission rate, which which is confounded by, by data issues, by recording issues, by a whole plethora of other factors which um, we are working through. And I think this takes me on to 7.5 now, which says the data quality issues that, that have been highlighted, um, the eHealth and Data Quality Group does meet, it's multidisciplinary, and it's their work to um, to really, uh, I talked about eliminating, eradicating um, these uh, these data issues so that we can come back with what will probably be a line very similar to the original line pre-track care. That's certainly the intention. So under the conclusions, um, it's, uh, it's kind of self-explanatory uh, and it's just really what I've said there, so I wouldn't really add to it. Um, but I realise, sorry about that, I know it's a, it's a technical, it's about um, the metrics that are there. Um, hopefully I've been able to give an account of what we believe is happening. Um, and uh, I'll stop looking at my screen now and see if anyone's got any questions. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Um, we have David who would like to ask a question first. Um, thanks, Andrew. and, and um, Thanks for going through that report, and I certainly agree about the the, the standardised mortality ratio it does provide a lot of reassurance. I think of the the care that people get in the hospital, but um, it would be remiss of me as a GP not to take an opportunity to highlight something that that really is very important to my GP colleagues. So, health statistics at a national level, of course, are never going to be accurate. Um, and 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 my opinion is we we shouldn't spend too much time trying to correct them. But we should use them as, as as a stimulus to quality improvement and and this stimulus here is to try and improve the quality of discharges so that we reduce unnecessary readmissions so so reasons for readmissions to hospital obviously they're, they are multifactorial aren't they but often if the transfer of care from the hospital care to general practice care is not is not good then this results in a, a potentially avoidable readmission so it, it should be it should be everyone's responsibility to ensure that, that patients leave hospital with a discharge letter to their GP immediately that safely transfers care from the hospital to general practice. So G, the GPs in Fourth Valley have, have provided very clear guidance on what, what we expect in a good transfer of care. And 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 you know I'm glad that Andrew and our hostel colleagues are, are working to ensure that this guidance is achieved. And 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 with if we implement this guidance and if we achieve it, I, I really think this will have a big impact on unnecessary readmissions. So it is important. Obviously, readmissions are an inevitability, but unnecessary readmissions are the things we really need to work on. So so thank you for your report, and and I hope you don't mind me plugging something that is really very very important to to general practice and and I think to the population. So. No, D David, I'm 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 delighted you you brought it up actually because because you're right. I'm. I'm when when I talk about statistics and numbers, it, it does look like there's, you know, we've got to be careful that we don't 
get false reassurance from that or complacency and say, oh, well, it's just it's a counting issue. Because you're absolutely right. One of the things, and I wouldn't shy away from it at all, uh, you've identified that your clinical lead colleagues, your GP colleagues, absolutely it has been a, a real concern for you. So, but by extension, a concern for me as well that, that people who are leaving the hospital, so just for colleagues who are not aware of the process, um, everyone that leaves the hospital, obviously they go with some medication, but they should go with a clear summary of what that episode of care is so that when um, the, the primary care colleagues are then picking up that transfer of care that they can see very clearly what they need to do and what, you know, they've got a really a clear understanding of what's going on. And that has not been um, anywhere near as good as it, as it needs to be. Um, and and uh, I think not just uh, David and his GP colleagues, but I think of the hospital side as well. They absolutely recognise that, that that system has not has not worked, especially in the last wee while when there's been significant pressures um, on everybody, especially around staffing. So, um, and David, I, I don't mind you plugging it at all because actually you've been one of the sort of key people to really help pull things together in the, uh, using that QI uh, approach. And um, I'm not going to overstate it, we're, we're still in the foothills of this, but I think there's a, a lot of important work and you and your GP colleagues are really helping us going to deliver a better process. We've got engagement in a way that I've not seen before. And I think that always creates the opportunity for us to make that better. But you're absolutely right. Let's not forget the statistics are one thing over there, but there's a patient yeah. who's been who's been discharged from the hospital, care's been transferred, and you guys are trying to pick that up in as safe a way as possible. And you don't always have the information to be able to do that. OK, thank you. Fiona, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I, I probably a, a couple of, well, now I've got another question <laughs> from that, that David came on. Um, I suppose um, my question is, why is there a system that only records inpatient, outpatient? Um, because I suppose in my mind, um, you have A and E a &A admissions and you record that them in a certain way. Um, and obviously there's different things like minor injuries, urgent care. Um, if people are coming in for an assessment, would that not be, should that not be recorded as part of that system of we, whether someone's coming in as an emergency, they're coming into urgent care, they're coming into minor injuries, they're coming into acute assessment or, or um, see you that they're actually they're in for an assessment of their needs at that particular time and and it seems and I, I wonder whether there's something about the system being developed to really refine that down um so that you actually understand not just about um uh, people being discharged from the assessment units but people being discharged from a and e or 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 um, a, a minor injuries so i suppose there's something around that um, because I, I think, you know, while I see that, um, excuse the figures, um, and I, can, I understand what you're saying about skewing the figures there, there's also something important around um, understanding what pathways are for people and, and what might, um, for some patients, might then end up with another readmission to A&E &E uh, and, 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 then, and then that followed through. And I suppose then my second question now that I didn't have before, but I have now, um, is um, around that um, a letters and information to GPs and pharmacy. I, I, I've had very fairly recent experience of this and that process um, no matter what health board, and, and there was another health board as well as the NHS Fourth Valley, it wasn't great, you know, and, and it involved a lot of, I suppose for me, running about trying to get copies of letters to GPs and pharmacies, where actually there seems something about a system that works really, really smoothly, particularly when we've got more digital systems where the pharmacy has information, the GP has information, and that would seem to be something that would really support positive discharge from that that assessment or whether it's any &E or or wards or whatever it seems that it would be something that if, we, if that system was really strong it would be really really helpful and, and obviously i hear what david's saying about a lot of work on that just to make that as 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 refined as possible so i suppose i'm not sure if there are questions or observations or what <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, are you happy, you, Michelle? I can I can try yeah. and pick those up. Um, see, I told you everybody was saving their, their questions for this week. <laughs> so, um, so the first point, um, yeah. So there is an ED module for this track care system, which deals with the the ED pathways. So you're right; these are people who are neither inpatient nor outpatient. Um, they're classified under ED, but it's once we get into the next stage of it, where we're forced to make those choices, which which are not ideal. Uh, the the system is is. Uh, it's a very unwieldy system. There's no local configuration you can do. It's not a nationally implemented system, but it is essentially the monopoly supplier in Scotland. So um, uh, the, this issue that we have uncovered, though, we, it's, it's, it's to do with our local implementation has, has been done, I think, which has created some of the issues. Um, but though there are specific modules for ED, but it's the assessment areas that we believe have, have been are in the wrong kind of categorization that is driving some of the data issues. But that if if people would like or benefit from it's quite a niche area, um, a more detailed breakdown of just how that footprint, these categories are created in, in a little bit more detail about um, uh, how we can evidence how that's driving some of the issues. I think that would be a um, a, a great kind of subtopic for the follow up um, paper, and I'm happy to to bring that back if that's what the what the question was for. You know. Um, yeah, the the IDLs and the the interfaces. I think so. This system I'm talking about, track care, it stops at the virtual edge of the hospital. It doesn't reach out and communicate and interface with um, with GP systems. And that was just that was national decisions about the specifications and what GPs need. And David's an expert on this for many health systems, very different from what a, a patient management system is. So there's a very clear break. But there's other routes for information to get pushed through through the HEPMA processes and, and the IDL parts of it, though. But it's they don't they don't talk as one electronic patient record across the whole system. And it's a constant bugbear and frustration to everybody involved in it. I mean, and, and as a patient, I can just imagine some of the when we get it wrong and um, some of the difficulties. And so what we end up having to do is there's a whole lot of manual input that's required. So, so when we think about an, an IDL being generated, that needs a junior doctor to be available to collate everything and check the, the patient's medication and then action the the sending of that and the authorization of that so if they're not available they're not prioritizing that because of the busyness of their job then that creates a delay and it becomes i was asking one of the clinical directors i think david you're on that cause how long does it take to do an ideal these days because when i used to do them you know with a different system um and and i was sort of thinking you know 10 15 minutes you no know, it can be up to an hour to do each idea which which is a huge amount of time so i think the problem that we get into then is that it's actually the human part of that that creates the difficulties and the delays there are electronic issues but you're right fiona that, that there are there are ways that we can we should be able to automate some of this but I think we're also going to have to look at the resourcing part of this. And are we asking the right people to do, take these um, jobs on? Because that, the trainees are, are an exceptionally busy group of people. And, and just to give you a further kind of comment on that, um, David and his GP colleagues brought to um, myself and others th this concern, just a, a, which was really exacerbated in the Omicron wave a month or two back. And um, what we agreed to do was put in an ad hoc process, a different process, which cut across these processes, but we're basically taking all the information that was that was written in the clinical notes that hadn't been signed off, but it was the thought processes of the clinical teams in the hospital side. They are recorded and we were scanning those directly to the GP practice so that when GPs were having to go and see a patient and there was no IDL, they still had something that would allow them to to, to formulate decision making. It was very much a temporary measure. We did it for a month. We've evaluated it. There was definite pros there was downsides as you can imagine for a, a new process the key thing was that it was not junior doctors that were having to sign it off we were getting admin people to just perform a task take these clinical records 14 pages i think it ended up being take these clinical records from people who have been through this the assessment areas specifically scan them to the gp practice so it was reliable it happened within minutes of the patient leaving the area 
but it wasn't it wasn't perfect and it cuts across some information governance and e-health things as well so it was very much done as a way to try and uh, improve the situation and it was done with input of uh, Dave and his colleagues but just to give you an idea about the fact that when we have sign off by medical staff which is there for quality control and make sure it's as high quality a discharge as possible that is a, a significant step so e-health solutions possibly we can certainly optimize those but but i also need to be thinking about who we're asking to do this and do we have the right people to, to be able to do it sorry that was a very long-winded answer for those two comments thank you right we also have uh, roger and then patricia so we'll go with roger first Thanks, Michelle. Just following up from David's point about giving the right information to GPs quickly, I'd have to say the same issue is, is relevant for social care. Um, I think many, many of us in social care will know of times when we suddenly found out by accident that somebody's been discharged from hospital and haven't got the, the care package up and running, all their house is complete uh, chaos. So I, I, the same same issue really is get, we need the, the information straight, uh, as soon as possible to, to social care. Thanks, Roger. We're getting better at understanding that through Patricia and our colleagues. They are always highlighting when there's been a difficulty or trying to always highlight to, to the hospital, the acute side, when there's been a difficulty. And we try to get some learning from that, but I'm sure it's a it's an ongoing frustration for exactly the same issues that were described. Thank you. And lastly, Patricia. Thank you. Just building on uh, Roger and colleagues' comments. Um, obviously, we're working in a system which is under quite sustained pressure um, and, and that can sometimes speed up people's uh, discharge or the need for people to be discharged or transfers of care um, from home to care home to packages of care, etc. So um, we had planned to bring something to clinical care governance just to do a wee bit of a review of, of any um, instances where that has fallen down mm -hmm. and um, I think it'll be very useful actually to to bring elements of that together from primary care GP perspective from the hospital perspective and and from social care and our care homes and our providers just to see where the learning points are and um, because there are similar issues and um, a lot of very very successful um, transfers of care but occasionally um, something was not quite right so it'd be helpful to do that I'll take that to clinical care governance. Absolutely I would agree Patricia that would be very helpful thank you any other questions or comments for Andrew? No okay so Andrew you're not looking for approval you're simply just looking for the the board to um, note the contents of your report and accept that you will uh, come back to us. In six I, I think so if that's appropriate I mean yeah. I am quite needy I do always like approval but uh, <laughs> uh, if it's not if it's not actually required I'll be happy to, to ask for people to note it but yeah and I think I've got some ideas there about information that people would like to see coming back just a little bit more detail around that picking up Fiona's point especially and, and we want to see those that gap on chart one starting to narrow. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you very much. That then takes us on to item 11, um, which is Sarah, which is the annual report of the Chief Social Work Officer. Thank you, Michelle, and good morning to everybody at board today. So every year, the Chief Social Work Officer must provide an annual report, giving an overview of how the statutory responsibilities of the Chief Social Work Officer have been fulfilled. These annual reports are submitted to Scottish Government where they are used to inform a national report which takes into account all of the issues that are affecting social work right across Scotland. The annual report for 2020-21 is appended to the cover report for this item. It was presented to Falkirk Council in September 2021 where it was approved and it has been submitted to Scottish Government within timescales. Scottish Government gave their approval for shorter reports to be provided both last year and this year and that was really response to the pressures that were across the social work and the social care and the partners that partnership system. But despite the offer for the providing of a shorter report, it did feel right to prepare a report that reflects not only the challenge that the pandemic brought to social work, service delivery and to the people that we serve, but to highlight the really incredible practice, the innovation and the creativity that was evident throughout, despite the challenges. 
In the introduction to my annual report, I note that every activity undertaken across the whole social work and social care system in 2021 has been impacted beyond measure. New ways of working had to be adopted at pace, mistakes were made, lessons were learned and partnership working was strengthened. There have been a, quite a number of achievements despite all of the pressures. Social work has never been more challenged, nor has it ever been as important um, than in the last 23 months, in my opinion. A challenge throughout Ford Social Work Service has been the need to respond to the pandemic related pressures whilst working towards recovery and amongst a changing busy policy and legislative landscape. In section one of my report, I highlight the role of the Chief Social Work Officer and I go on to provide a summary overview of the committees and groups across the Council the partnership and the health and social care partnership that I have responsibilities to. I outline how these groups adapted to the pandemic response and their key achievements. At section 1.5, I outline how the Public Protection Chief Officer Group, which is chaired by Falkirk Council's Chief Executive, merged with the Stirling and Clark Manager Chief Officers Group. A specific COVID-19 remit and dedicated risk register were developed to ensure our collective leadership focus, assurance and scrutiny was on the right areas and those areas were staffing levels, changes in demand, capacity to protect children and adults, information sharing, resilience. The Scottish Government introduced a weekly data set for both child and adult protection um, near the beginning of the first lockdown and an analysis of the data that we reported was taken to the Chief Officers Group at every meeting. Sections 1.6 to 1.8 provide an overview of the critical work undertaken by the Falkirk ADP, Child Protection Committee and Adult Protection Committee. Working together to support the most vulnerable in our communities was a key consideration of our public protection strategic groups during 2021. And as Paul outlined for us earlier today, communication and engagement strategies were developed to strengthen the public's awareness of how to report concerns and new COVID-19 guidance was developed and that supported our workforce. And that was about making sure that we were operating safely and ensuring that vulnerable children and adults received the support that they needed. The social work chart team was an important development in 2021 and it's outlined at 1.14. And the team have had a central role in gathering and monitoring intelligence from the, our care homes across Falkirk as well as through local engagement processes with the care homes on a daily basis. And the information that they gathered has proved really pivotal in understanding the support needs of the care homes and making sure that we are working together and putting in place all of the appropriate support. Section two of the annual report outlines service quality and performance, specifically relating to the statutory responsibilities of the Chief Social Work Officer. And it doesn't seek to replicate the detail that is provided to other governance forums, such as the IGB um, and Clinical Care Governance Committee at different times throughout the year. Information about the number of guardianship orders in place, adult protection referrals, self-directed support, support for carers, community payback orders and other matters can all be found within that section. At 2.17, my statutory responsibility to publish an organisational duty of candour report is fulfilled and the detail of that report was considered recently at the Clinical and Care Governance Committee. Section three of the report provides a brief overview of social work budgets and the challenges within. The section then develops to summarise the important transformation work that's underway in children's services, social work and adult social work to ensure that our services and our workforce are sustain sustainable, fit for the future and operating at an optimum to support people to have better outcomes. Workforce planning and development is presented at section four. Justice, children and adult social work services are reporting concern about recruitment and retention of experienced registered social workers. Teams are experiencing churn and that's really challenging to manage. Given the rising demand for social work services and the increasing complexity of the work, experienced social workers are under growing pressure because of the skill that they bring to assessment and intervention. We are attracting newly qualified registered social workers to Falkirk and they bring with them fresh perspective, enthusiasm and are a valued part of our workforce. 
Various strategies are being developed for our local requirements and the issue has been highlighted nationally as this is a broader issue across Scotland and one that requires immediate attention. Recruitment within the care at home workforce is proving very challenging as you're aware an array of different approaches are underway to attract people to social care in Falkirk. Although learning and development opportunities for staff moved largely online during the reporting period and there was disruption, certainly in the initial weeks of lockdown, our commitment to offering quality opportunities to our workforce and partners continues and we receive really good feedback about our training offer. The impact of COVID-19 is presented within section five of my annual report, but the whole report, every section is set against a back cloth of the pandemic. The significant impact of the coronavirus on our communities, workforce and services has been substantial. Sadly, there's been so many losses, there's been losses of life and that impact of loss will have long lasting impact on many. The trauma in our communities is reflected in our workforce. And I need to be trauma informed as a whole system is a priority currently in our firm focus. Workforce wellbeing is detailed within section 5.2. Our teams continually highlight the need to sustain team cohesion and how important it is to have opportunities to come together as a whole. We've taken time to explore compassionate leadership and sustainable wellbeing initiatives. <clears throat> Given that there is no one size fits all approach to supporting our staff, we continue to offer a range of support in a range of ways and continue to listen and hear what people need both individually and collectively. Section 5.8 provides an overview of a support line that was put in place for families and children in Falkirk during the first lockdown. This was developed really quickly to meet need that was evident from our analysis of the data. And it's just one example in the report of many of the really great partnership we have with our third sector colleagues to collaborate and create. Section 5.9 summarises how our justice service workforce and partners rose to the challenge of the pandemic. The service worked in partnership with our community justice partners. Services were commissioned to ensure that individuals needs were best met given the restrictions we were all working under. So the report covers the period 20 to 21, which does now seem, I acknowledge, uh, a really long time ago. However, I, I'm going to conclude, um, Chair, my presentation by recognising that the challenges and the pressures outlined in the report have continued into this year. We are experiencing the impact now of pent up demand stemming from lockdown. The social work front door is revolving with individuals and families requiring support for the first time, but their needs are more complex than we would typically see at the initial stage of referral. Our capacity is stretched and like every other workforce, we're impacted by the need for people to isolate on occasion. Staff have leave to use, they need the leave to rest, and we're still operating from home and workplace in order to keep people safe. Additionally, as outlined earlier, we have vacancies and we're working hard to fill those. Suitable workforce capacity is under constant review. I really do hope that this report suitably reflects the dedication of Falkirk social work and social care workforce across the entire sector. They continue to go above and beyond and demonstrate professional integrity and such commitment to the people that we work alongside. And I am really thankful to them. Chair, the recommendations are set out in section two of the cover report and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, do we have any questions for Sarah? Fiona. Not a question, more of a, more of a comment and, yeah. and um, uh, Sarah will have a, a made this comment um, more than once. Um, I obviously haven't seen the, the, the report in, in, in full council. Um, and, and I think that point of the, the the huge effort by staff and the huge commitment by staff, I didn't think it, you know, across all sectors and the resilience and innovation they've shown and, and how well they've worked in partnership to, to really help and support um, the the uh, individuals in our community, and and I think that um, I, I think um, 
Sarah's point about the the support that 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 staff need and and will continue to to need to recover. I know we're 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 in this phase of of living with COVID, whatever that means. It seems a little bit scary at the moment, but um, a, you know that it's it's an ongoing pressure that staff are have faced for for two years. Um, and um, it, it doesn't necessarily show any signs at the moment of 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 changing, and 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 I think also um, you know that the the the, the pressures, and, and I know that Sarah's mentioned it more than once around um, um, uh, people providing support, carers providing support in the community as well, and and um, I. I, I, I it, 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 it's, di it's difficult to, to say enough about how much everybody's contributed and how much support will be needed going forward. Um, but I, I think I just wanted to record thanks and, and mm -hmm. um, I, I hope we'll see an improved picture and we'll be we'll be seeing some support and, and helping. But I know that pent up demand is just going to continue that 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 ongoing need to 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 provide support. So it's, um, I thank you very much, Sarah. Okay, thank you, Fiona. We've also got Frank who would like to come in. Frank Donnelly. Uh, hi, Sarah. Uh, looking at pressures that social services are under, when it comes to reviews, why two reviews in one year instead of one? Reviews take a long time for each social worker to be present at. And <clears throat> uh, normally it used to be one review, now it's uh, in a year, now it's two. Is there a reason for that? Thank you, Jane. Um, Frank, could I just clarify, are you referring to reviews of individuals in terms of their, their, their care plans? Yes. Okay. So, um, Martin might want to come in and respond to that change, because I think, Frank, you're referring specifically to a change in practice around the reviewing of adults and adult care plans. Yes. Okay. Martin? Martin with us? I'm not sure I can hear Frank's dog, but I can't hear Martin. <laughs> I wonder, um, yeah. I, I know time is getting on, and Frank, I'm going to have um, Martin come back to you directly on that, if that's okay. That's okay. It was just because if it saves time, if it, you, you only need the one review instead of two. Okay. I'm sure there is a very good reason, but I think it would probably make sense if Martin responds directly to you, so we can arrange for that to happen. I'm now going to move on to Margot. Very, very quick comment. Just to commend the report and the work which social work are doing. And to say that sadly, we're only really seeing the tip of the iceberg, I think at the moment in, mm. in society with all the tremendous pressures and financial pressures under which people are finding themselves. And the pressure on the council to provide the services which it does already. But I just see an expansion and want to sort of express a, a gratitude on behalf of service users for all that's being done. Thank you, Margot. I know that that will mean uh, that will mean a lot to Sarah and our staff as well. Um, are we? I can't see any other hands, so I'm going to propose that we um, acknowledge that we've considered. Yeah, sorry, Ms. Margot had her hand up. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry, who's got their hand up, Suzanne? It was Margot. Oh, no, Margot, that's fine. Margot's coming. <laughs> <She has. laughs> no, you're absolutely fine. So what I'm going to suggest then is that we we acknowledge that we've considered. Sorry, that we, you know, we have considered the reports, um, and and we've had a discussion about it. But what I would like it to be minuted is that we acknowledged, as the IGB, we acknowledge the commitment, skills, and experience of social work staff and continue to deliver. Um, this high quality of service during this time. I think that's really important and something that I, I certainly would like in the minutes because you can see from um, Sarah's report that um, our colleagues in social work have done some phenomenal work in a really difficult time. 
Okay, that then takes us on to item 12, and Susanna, believe it's you, so perfect timing. Yeah, and sorry for interrupting. I wasn't sure if it was a follow-up question, so apologies for that. And good morning, everybody. Um, the, the last report you've got today on your agenda is um, setting out a range of governance matters uh, for decision and noting today. So um, I'll present these under the report headings and link to the related recommendations, if that's OK with you, because there's, there's quite a few recommendations for the board to consider today. So the first is in relation to membership to the board, um, our audit committee and further anticipated changes that are going to happen. So the board is asked uh, to note at 2.1 that Councillor Robert Bidsett has been appointed as a voting member of Falkirk Council. And I'm aware we had some of this discussion at the introduction, but it's just formally in terms of the, the process. Um, as a consequence of Councillor Black's resignation, there is a vacancy on the audit committee. And the report notes that although there are no further meetings scheduled before the elections, we are asking you to appoint to the vacancy in the event that a special meeting is required. And that's set out in Recommendation 2.2. And finally, in relation to membership, we are anticipating further changes, and that's through a combination of factors such as the elections mm -hmm. um, and sort of terms of office. Um, and again, we've already noted some of those changes earlier on in, in relation to our nurse director, chief finance officer and our carer representative. Um, so what we are doing just now, we are currently reviewing memberships in terms of office and we're working with our third, third sector partners on the recruitment to the current vacancy we have for our third sector representatives. And we're setting out uh, that we'll bring back an update to the June meeting for the board's consideration. And the next section around the paper we're asking for considerations on relate to meeting dates and the meeting arrangements that we have. So the board is asked to, to note that we are proposing a change um, from the meeting date from the 3rd to the 10th of June. And that was just due to the public holiday that we, we got benefit from but missed in the calendar. So apologies for that. Um, the board is also asked to agree to a further development session and we are proposing that that's held jointly with the strategic planning group and the HSCP senior leadership team on the 28th of March. Um, some of you will have received sort of diary invitations around that already, but that was to consider the work to date on the Falkirk Community Hospital Master Plan and the primary care initial agreement um, and that's just ahead of um, a a board report that we would bring forward in June. So the recommendations that to that section relate to 2.3 and 2.4 of the report. Um, we're also uh, set a paper setting out proposals for meetings as planned for June. Um, but in the meantime, we're proposing that we continue to meet remotely and again links to that 2.5 in the report. And at section 2.6, we're asking the board to agree the revised standing orders and they're attached to Appendix 1. Um, there had been sections that um, had been omitted in error uh, when we'd asked for previous approval to this, so that's just to correct that. Section 7 of the report notes the revised councillor's code of conduct that came into effect from December 2021 and these apply to councillors as members of the IGIB. So along with ch these changes made um, as well as changes to the model code of conduct for public bodies, this does provide us a good opportunity to review our IGIB's uh, code of conduct and at recommendation 2.6, uh, 7, sorry, the board is asked to note that this review will be done and a proposal for a new code brought to a future meeting. The board's asked to note at 2.8 that uh, the annual climate change report for 2021 um, has been submitted to Sustainable Scotland Network, so that ensures we're compliant with that requirement. And finally, the board is asked to note the ongoing work regarding accessibility legislation for websites of public bodies at 2.9. And Paul had noted some of the work that, that's already been done um, already at that um, area of work um, in his uh, comms update report. So in conclusion, we're just asked to approve or note the recommendations set out at 2.1 to 2.9. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Any questions or comments for Suzanne over this?
Suzanne, I don't think there is anything. I'm not going to go through all nine of those. I think you've already done it. So on the basis of the fact that no one is asking any questions or raising any concerns, I think it would probably be fair to say that um, we agree the recommendations that you've outlined and, and, and note the other points that you've made. OK, thank you very much, Suzanne. That then takes us on to the last item for today, which is to, which is essentially the approved minutes of a, a range of meetings. Now, we tend not to spend too much time in this, but I'll go through each committee one by one. So starting with audit, um, I just wanted to know if there was anything anyone wished to add. Now, I can see that Gordon, who's the chair, is not actually here. So I don't know if anyone has anything else they feel needs to be shared in respect of um, audit committee. No? Uh, clinical and care governance. Now, Fiona, you are the chair of that one. Anything you feel you need to add in addition to the, the set of three minutes that's there? No, I don't think so. No, fantastic. Thank you so much. And then we've got the joint staff forum, but I believe Robert Clark is not here. So I don't know if anyone has anything they wish to add or share. No. And the strategic planning group. So, Patricia, you chair that one. So, I can see there's just one set of minutes there for that. Is there anything else you, you wish to add or share? No, thank you. No, thank you very much. OK, that brings us to the end of the meeting today. Um, I know we don't have an EOCB on the agenda, but I will just check in case anyone has anything they, they wish to, to bring up before we finish the meeting today. No, okay. Thank you so very much. Um, the next meeting, I think Suzanne will be 10th of June, is that right? Um, so if I don't see you all before then, I will see you then. Um, stay safe and a big thank you to our three colleagues who are uh, leaving us today. Thank you so much for all, for all your input and you will be greatly missed. Thank, thank you. Everyone.